Hi, it's Dr. Robert Seichert. Thanks for tuning in to a new episode of the Doctor Podcast Show. And today we're going to have a great show and we have a great guest, Dr. Martier Stone, who's a physician who was involved in the Ebola epidemic in Africa, in West Africa, approximately 10 years ago. And it's uh, very timely to discuss this because as you know, we've just gotten over the COVID pandemic worldwide. And now there's a possibility that there may be a bird flu epidemic or hopefully not a pandemic. So it's a great time to uh, discuss uh, this topic of epidemics and pandemics and viruses. And today we're going to also be discussing uh, this uh, great book. It's called Collapse and Resiliency, the inside story of Liberia's unprecedented Ebola response. Uh, this book was written by Dr. Uh, Tolbert Nienza, Nienswa, and also co-authored by Dr. Marty A. Stone, who's uh, our guest today. Uh, Dr. Stone, thanks very much uh, for coming today. I really appreciate you taking the time from your busy uh, schedule uh, to do this. It's my uh, pleasure. Yeah, and uh, just to introduce Dr. Stone, she's a World Health Organization consultant, WHO consultant. Uh, she's also a senior advisor to the Massachusetts General Hospital, which is part of Harvard, the Division of Global Psychiatry. And she's also the co-author of this excellent book, uh, which I recommend highly. I actually reviewed the book before doing uh, this show to try to learn more about it, and I got very uh, involved in the book and read it and couldn't put it down. I highly recommend the book uh, for everyone. Uh, tell us about your educational background and then we'll get into how you got involved in the Ebola epidemic in, in Africa, which also spread to other parts of the world. Yes, I had my early education, well, the early grades in Liberia, and then I went to boarding school in England and uh, went back to Liberia, finished high school, and then I came to the States to, to college. And after that, went to medical school in Boston and did training in OBGYN, first in surgery and then OBGYN. And then I, after 20 years of doing clinical practice, I went back to school to get a master's in public health at Columbia University. And, Cause I wanted to work with WHO. Right. And I was being told that, well, you don't have a, an MPH, so you won't be able to get a job with WHO. And, I'll say, and I said, I'll fix it. Right. And so I went back to school and got a, an MPH. And you know, shortly after that, I was able to get a consulting assignment with the WHO to go to Ukraine. And um, when was that? When, when were you in This was in 2004, I think it was. I went to Ukraine. And it was a three month assignment, WHO, in collaboration with an organization in DC that was funded by USAID. And so I had this assignment to actually um, do an assessment of the PMTCT program, the prevention of maternal to child transmission of HIV and AIDS because they had a $9 million grant, Ukraine, and they wanted to see how, how well prepared the government of Ukraine was, was, and the hospitals were prepared to execute this grant. And so that's what I went there to do the assessment. And you know, it was my first time going to Eastern Europe and it was actually quite an amazing experience. Right, it must have been. You've been all over the world <laughs> and also had uh, incredible training all over the world as well. Uh, tell us a bit about Liberia. I think people in the audience may not know exactly where Liberia is. It's in Africa. Um, and uh, tell us, uh, I'm, I'm going to actually show a map during the uh, show to uh, demonstrate where it is. But tell us about the history of Liberia, which is very important to know. Well, the political entity that's known as Liberia was founded in 1847 by a group of American freed slaves at the time, they were known, who went back to Africa and established, you know, because they wanted to go back after the emancipation. They went back to Africa and established this political entity and called it Liberia. The land of liberty brought us here is the slogan. 
So and these so, were freed American right. slaves who went back to Africa. Right. So Liberia, but the Liberians, the indigenous people were there. You know, they had the indigenous uh, culture, the indigenous governments, the indigenous um, habits. <laughs> right. And so, so the, 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 the incoming people, the new group of people that came, formed this political entity and ruled the country for most of the history of Liberia until 1980 when there was an overthrow of the government and President Talbert was assassinated and then we had the new emerging indigenous government of Samuel Doe. Right. And that, sure. that was the transformation, the beginning of the transformation of Liberia as it is today. That's very fascinating. When I read the book, I was fascinated by the fact that when the freed slaves from America went uh, to Liberia, they really weren't accepted too much by the indigenous people, and there was some fighting going on because there were different cultures, but eventually they, they kind of got together and uh, make things uh, work. So that was a fascinating history. Well, it was difficult in the beginning because even though people had, you know, their ancestors had been taken from Africa to, and brought to the Americas, when they returned, they es essentially were Americans. Right. <laughs> and so you know, they were foreign to the people that were there, the indigenous people that were there. And therein lie the problem. And that problem existed until the coup d'etat of, you know, of 1980, because what happened then, the Americo Liberians, as they became known, ruled the country. They ruled the government, they ruled every institution in the country. And in order to attend school, people who were born to indigenous parents had to literally live with one of the settlers uh, that they, they called them then the settler community in order to have an education. And so in 1980, when there was this coup d'etat and the indigenous government took over, you know, we began to have a lot of dissension amongst the two groups. Right. There were a couple of civil <laughs> wars I read also in the book. And uh, yeah. A lot of people unfortunately uh, died during that struggle. So tell us about the origins of the Ebola virus. The Ebola virus is a very deadly virus. Uh, it has about an 80 to 90 percent mortality rate uh, if it's not treated. When was Ebola first discovered? I know it was discovered in, in Africa. And, and how did it get to Liberia in ab about 2014? Well, Ebola, what became known as Ebola, was a virus that was discovered along the Ebola River. A group of people in that, in that area, in the communities along the river bank, manifested this disease. And uh, they died, you know, within a matter of days after contracting it. And so there was a, a scientist, epidemiologist, Dr. Miembe, a, a Congolese doctor, who sent the samples to Belgium. It, at that time, Zaire was part of the, it was the Belgium, Belgian Congo. Right. And so they sent the samples to Belgium to be evaluated. To, and and, and uh, Peter Piot, you've heard of him, he's now, he, I think he's still at the, the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene. He was one of the, the scientists that went to Zaire in order to assess the situation. And so when they got back to Belgium, they named this virus Ebola after the Ebola River, where it had first manifested. Interestingly, the, the doctor in, in the Congo who discovered it initially didn't get credit no, uh, he, for it. The, the Belgian uh, doctors took credit for discovering the virus, even though he was the one who discovered it. Yeah, his name is Jean-Jacques Miembe. Uh, the, the, the reason being that during those, during those days, you know, Zaire, the, it was a Belgian Congo. It was right. colonized by Belgium. And so the tendency then was for colonizers to do what they usually did, take credit for everything that they didn't discover. And right. that's basically what happened with Ebola. So 
now, with the West African epidemic, Dr. Miembe, you know, took a center stage because he came into Liberia um, and literally helped us to turn things around right. because he came with a group of, of scientists and a group of medics from the Congo and actually taught us, gave us the advice on what we needed to do to turn the situation around because they had had so many experiences dealing with Ebola. Right. Now, how did Ebola get to Liberia in, in 2014? Does anybody know? Do we know how that occurred? Well, it, actually, Ebola got to Liberia f from the, the Guinea that Liberia shares with, with, from the border that Liberia shares with Guinea. Apparently, there was a young boy who contracted Ebola in Guinea, and within a matter of days, he and his whole household were dead, mm. you know, and that's how it started in Guinea. So that whole area got infected, but because Liberia shares a border with Guinea, and the way the, way the situation works in, in Africa, the, bo the borders are very porous because you have families that live on both sides of the border. When the um, colonizers went to, Liber went to Africa and divided up these different, country these different countries, they were really one big uh, community. And so when they made the political boundaries, you have family members of or clans of one group lived on one side and right. the other group lived on the other side. So they sort of walked across through little pathways from one country right. to the other. So this virus seems to pop up every few years or decades in, in different locations. Um, well, it, it, this was the first, in 2014 when it came to Liberia and then West Africa, this was the first time that it had actually manifested in West Africa. Right. In, and, the, in that magnitude. Right. And then it was also in Sierra Leone, which also borders uh, Liberia yeah. and, and Guinea as well. Yeah, so you so have what they call countries. Yeah, you have what they call the Mano River Basin. There's a river that sort of runs between the three countries, Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. And so all of these Mano River countries were affected because they all share borders. They all have family members across the borders. And people, so in the, in the case of Liberia, people from Guinea cross the border into Liberia and in a, an area called Lufa County, and because they had family members there, but when they came into Guinea, into Liberia, they had already been infected. They may not have been displaying symptoms at the time, but somebody got infected in Liberia and died. And family members of that group left the area and migrated actually to Monrovia. And that's how Ebola began to spread from the border in Liberia shares with Guinea into Monrovia. And Monrovia is the capital of Liberia, right? Monrovia is the capital it's of Liberia. There's a million people living there, from what I read. A little over uh, a million people live in Monrovia. So we all heard that the Ebola virus is very deadly and, and uh, is, has a high mortality rate. Tell us what symptoms people got and how they tragically died? Well, Ebola is a hemorrhagic disease, which means that you know once you contract it, you tend to bleed from every orifice practically. So people, there was a woman who left Lofa County in a taxi, and the way it works in in that part of Af in Li Liberia, taxis are not like taxis over here. They're they're taxis that carry, you know, you could have seven, eight people in one car. And so everybody is sort of sitting on top of each other. And apparently when they left Lofa County and came into an area called Firestone, which is near where the international airport is, Roberts International Airport, the woman became ill and started vomiting. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the symptoms, uh, profuse vomiting, headaches, profuse headaches, fever, and, uh, and bleeding. But she started vomiting profusely, and so they took her out of the taxi and sent her to a clinic. 
But the people that were in the taxi continued yeah, on it. to Monrovia. And when they got into Monrovia, they dispersed into different communities. And that's really how Liberia was, I mean, Ebola was introduced into Monrovia, which is the most populous uh, city because it's the capital. Right. So uh, people die because they're basically bleeding out of, from everywhere and they have severe pain and uh, it Pe takes a few days to, to die from this. Yeah, people died because uh, a lot of them did not go to the hospital initially. What happens in those environments, they, they tended to go to traditional healers, mm -hmm. you know, and, and especially people who live in rural areas seeking care tended to go to traditional healers or not go to the hospital until they really had symptoms that they could not uh, con control. And so people died because not only did they not know what Ebola was and did not recognize the symptoms, but they lived in very populated houses. For example, one family would have seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 people living in two rooms or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so they, because of the, the close-knit communities that they went into, households got infected and people died because of that. Right. Another interesting thing I read in the book is due to certain cultural uh, issues, uh, the virus spread even after someone died because of ritual cleaning and other type of uh, things that, that people did with the dead bodies. And, and that also caused uh, the virus to spread. Yes, there are, there are rituals in traditional societies, especially people in rural areas. Um, when someone dies, they go through uh, uh, the, the ritual of washing them. And sometimes they wash them and reuse the, the bath water to wash others as a way of transferring spirit, the, the spirit of the individual that has mm -hmm. gone ahead. And, so you ha and then because uh, the, the burials contained um, all of this, these activities, and also because you had people in very tight, con confined spaces. You know, Ebola spread because if you touch me and you're pr sweating profusely, if you coughed on me, if you, uh, if you were sharing beddings with me, if you were in the same household with me sharing anything. Utensils. Any food. utensils. Any you know, body fluid is contagious. Body it's fluid contagious is virus. contagious. Right. Uh, uh, blood and body, uh, other body fluids. And so people got infected because they didn't know what it was. Right. First of all, the government didn't know what it was. Right. The health, care, the health ministry didn't really know what it was. And people kept saying that, well, Ebola isn't going to hit Liberia it's going to happen somewhere else, you know, isn't right. it? You never, think it's, think. you never think it's coming to you until it arrives. And so when Ebola hit Monrovia, the Ministry of Health didn't really know what to do about it. Well, no one in the world knew because uh, this was a major uh, outbreak that had never and it, occurred. And it was new. And so the messaging, the public health messaging, were confusing to people because nobody really knew what it was. And, you're, and so when they finally began to figure out that people should not live in these, uh, should not be in these closed confinements and shouldn't share beds right. and shouldn't, you know, shouldn't come in close proximity to each other where they could come in contact with bodily fluids, um, people were saying, well, <laughs> we cannot even shake hands, which is one of the traditions in Liberia. We cannot touch, we, can, we cannot hug, we cannot do anything that is hum, our human interactions. And so people re pre resisted the public health messages. And, and, and a lot of the messages were given to an indigenous body of people who may not have understood English very well or had understood what was being trans communicated to them. And so they just went along doing what they usually did. Tradition and culture. Tradition and culture. And the messages were not in la a language that they really clearly understood. 
And so we found that you had to change the public health messages to make it more sensitive, to take the culture into, into consideration, all the nuances of the culture into consideration, in order for the people to listen. Right. And that was one of the most difficult things, getting people to stop doing what they usually do in the name of the culture, especially when it came to burying the dead. Right. So they started hiding people who were sick. They yeah. started hiding people who were sick. And when they found many members of the household were getting infected, they actually started throwing people, sick people outside in the street. Right, and I so, read that in the book. Yeah, and so some people died in the streets, and you had the stench in the air, and like you know, in Monrovia, because dead bodies were left in the, and the, the, the government didn't have the capacity to remove all of these corpses, right. you know. So safely. you had safe, safely remove all right. the cor corpses, and not even the the equipment to sa to remove them, you know, save or unsafe. But until they they found out how to do it properly. They, uh, it, it was very difficult. It was right. a very difficult thing. And, and that's, then, that's where Dr. Nienswa, the author of the book, uh, and your co-author comes in. And there's a couple of really interesting chapters in the book, uh, almost like a love story. It tells how <laughs> Dr. Nienswa grew up, uh, what his childhood was like, how he met his wife, and how he uh, then got involved in helping get rid of Ebola. So tell us how Dr. Nianswa got involved and how he convinced the people in Liberia to follow his instructions and directions. Well, he, was, he, he had actually come home from Johns Hopkins where he did his MPH. And he had been working with the Ministry of Health and had received a scholarship to go to Johns Hopkins to do his public health degree. And about uh, while he was graduating, he was promoted because his boss, who was the assistant minister of health for prevention, was retiring. And so she recommended him to take her place. So when he came back to Liberia, he was uh, promoted to the, being assistant minister of health for preventive services and also deputy chief medical officer in that, in that role. And so when Ebola hit, you know, the people said to him, well, you just came from Johns Hopkins with a public health degree. You should know all about this, you know, public health. So they literally threw him out there to be the spokesperson for Ebola, the Ebola, Ebola epidemic. And that's really how he got involved. But then um, as Ebola worsened, as the case fatality rates increased, um, and the, government, the president decided, well, some, something has to be done because we cannot just see all these, the, actually the WHO, CDC, they made this prediction that within a certain, a limited time span of a few months, there would be at least uh, 200,000 deaths or something to that to that extent. Right. And Mrs. Sirleaf, who was the president at the time, said, not on my watch. Literally, right. to her words, not on my watch. And so she wanted to have somebody who would be the focus, who would literally lead the response and not have any other responsibility. Because the Minister of Health had to deal with the, the administrative aspects of the ministry as well as the public health aspects. The chief medical officer had to deal with um, clinical care. You know, people, they had to run the hospitals and all of those things in addition to dealing with an epidemic response. And they really didn't have the experience because this had never happened before. Right. And so Mrs. Sirleaf was advised uh, that you needed somebody, I think by the CDC, the WHO, you needed somebody to just make this their focus and have no other responsibility. And so because Talbert had been literally the voice of Ebola in Liberia, because he was actually on all the radio stations, he was talking to all the international uh, agent, news agencies, people had heard his name and so the recommendation was made that, well, why don't you put this guy? Right. <laughs> I think actually the CDC, WHO recommended that he should be the one to lead the response because right. he had good leadership capabilities. And so once 
they made the decision to have an incident manager because then Ebola was considered an incident. And so they needed to have an incident manager to lead the response. So in August, August the 11th, he was officially appointed by President Sirleaf to be the incident manager for the Liberian Ebola response. And so that's how he got into it. So his role as deputy uh, assistant minister of health were then turned over to somebody else to do the day to day. So his focus was only on Ebola. Right. And it created a lot of dissension within the ministry. Right, because he rose to the top very quickly, bypassed some other people who were there for a while. There were people who thought that they should have been the one. Right. There were people who th thought that other people should have been selected, who had more experience in epidemiology and things of that nature, who had more experience, uh, who had been in the ministry longer in different capacities. Politics. And so, uh, and, and then the minister, <laughs> you know, we, felt that he should have been the incident manager. But because he was dealing with the administrative aspects, trying to get um, attention, the world at global attention, and get funding to deal with this and, and expertise, technical assistance from abroad, he needed somebody to assist him. The chief medical officer needed, according to the president then, she needed to actually focus on keeping the hospitals going. Because you had a lot of people with chronic illness, illnesses who didn't have Ebola, that couldn't get care. Right. Because all the hospitals literally shut down. The hospitals shut down, uh, doctors weren't going to work, nurses weren't going to work, everybody was afraid of getting it's Ebola. It's kind of similar to what happened when COVID started here, everything else kind of shut down. Right. Similar, similar. similar problem. So uh, President Sirleaf, and by the way, she wrote the foreword to the book and uh, very fascinated by her. Uh, tell me just briefly, how did she become uh, president? Because I read the literacy rate in, uh, rate in Liberia was, was pretty low and it was actually lower for women. How did she get to become uh, president and make all these important decisions uh, that eventually eliminated Ebola? Well, President Sirleaf had, is a, is a well-educated woman, and she had previously been in government. She previously had worked in the Talbert government, I think, in the Ministry of Finance, because finance is her, is her background. And, but she ran a campaign. <laughs> you know, she had, I think this was her second campaign, running to be president. And it, she, she had mobilized people from all over the place, people from all the Liberians in the diaspora and other people, friends of Ellen in, in the diaspora, were mobilized because people, you know, there had been a civil war for an extended period of time, you know, 14 years, and people wanted somebody who could take over and run the country and stop the war, you know, t turn things around. Right. And so she ran a very good campaign. Uh, one of the things that she did, though, was to involve the, the market women who have, who have a very big indigenous following. And so she got, mobilized the women of Liberia from every different walk of life and ran this campaign. Yeah. And she won. Right. <laughs> she didn't win right. initially. They had to, you know, they had so many people running. There were like, I think, 14 people right. in the first round, and they narrowed it down to two people, she and George Weir, who is now the outgoing, the president, that's the out, the president that succeeded her right. after 12 years. Uh, she's pretty amazing because she was able to pick the right leaders to work with her to get things done and, and get things uh, accomplished. Like... Uh, you know, picking your, your colleague to uh, lead the Ebola. Well, she's a, she's a visionary and she's a no-nonsense person. Okay. <laughs> and so once she decided that this was the person she wanted, she, you know, she didn't relent. She just said to the minister, you need to focus on the administration of the public health system. Right. And the chief medical officer, you need to get the hospitals up and running. Right. 
Uh, one of the things I read that was interesting in the book also was that uh, there were some people who came from Europe and the USA to help out. Yes. Uh, and uh, a few of them got ill. And as soon as they got ill, they were transported back to Europe. And I remember uh, a couple of people came back to the USA and everybody was very nervous here that we would all catch Ebola from the person coming back. Uh, the people in Liberia weren't too happy with how quickly the Americans and Europeans were being evacuated and going to sophisticated hospitals, whereas the people in Liberia weren't getting that uh, kind of help initially. Well, uh, Ken Brantley, who was the American physician that got infected and, uh, and one of the nurses, they were missionaries. Mm -hmm. and worked in this missionary hospital called ELWA, uh, the acronym for Eternal Love Winning Africa. They started off at, with a radio station and made uh, deals with the government to give them land with the intent of opening schools to educate people. And so they had this mission hospital and they were actually there on assignment before Ebola struck and in the line of doing their work, they contracted Ebola. But the Liberians uh, became upset when all of a sudden you had an air ambulance coming to evacuate these two Americans. And at the same time, there were Liberians who were working with them, who were infected, who subsequently died, who didn't have the same privilege of being evacuated right. because they were not Americans. And so the Liberians put a lot of pressure on Mrs. Sirleaf, on the government, and saying that you have to, you have to take, a, take a position. You know, will all these people, foreigners coming here, be evacuated when, it, right. when they get sick and, the other, and everybody is going to be left to die? So uh, there were a lot of protesting about that. But there was not much that the government could do right. because ELW it ended up being a private institution, and I guess the private entities could do whatever they wanted to do at that time. Right, and uh, also I recall, I remember this, that one of the doctors who got sick there, who was from the USA, actually came to Bellevue Hospital here, which is a, a few blocks from where we are now, and uh, he was treated at Bellevue Hospital, and I remember the whole hospital almost shut down because they were afraid everybody would catch uh, Ebola from him. But the Which, first two people went to Atlanta. They went to, the, the to CDC. Emory. Uh, yes, yeah, CDC Emory. Right. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that's interesting. Now, uh, the United States and uh, also the CDC and the U.S. military did help out with this, right? They, they sent a lot of... Uh, people there who are experts in infectious disease and also lots of money to Liberia to help build hospitals and intensive care units. Well, but they came late. They came late. By the, t by the time the military arrived, the Liberians had pretty much figured along with the WHO what they needed to do. Uh, so they the, the military came and provided logistical support, s building tents, e Ebola uh, treatment units around the country. Uh, but President Ebola was approached by uh, the ambassador, De ambassador then, Mrs. Uh, Deborah Mellock. She was the ambassador, U.S. ambassador to Liberia. And Mrs. Sirleaf, the President Sirleaf, sent a message to President Ebola and said, listen, you have to help us because if you don't, we're all going to die. Right. And, and you don't know whether, you know, this disease will hit the United States, which it ended yeah. up hitting and uh, coming subsequently. But President Obama decided to send in the military and actually send in a lot of aid. So the military came and built up all these Ebola treatment units. But, but all credit must be given, though, to MSS, MSF, Médecins Sans Frontières, uh, uh, Belgium. They were the first that came and set up. That's the Doctors Without Borders. The Doctors right? Without Borders mm -hmm. that set up the biggest treatment unit, Ebola treatment unit in, like, in Monrovia. But before then, credit must be given to uh, Dr. Jerry Brown, who's a Liberian. He was the medical director of ELW Hospital at the time. 
So what he did, he turned the, the chapel into an Ebola treatment unit because <laughs> they, they, that was the only place he could yeah. put, isolate people. And what happened was they started sending, being selective about who would go into that unit. And so the people, the, the Liberians who worked with him became enraged. And they said, you're catering to all the foreigners. So, you know, if, if, if we get Ebola, we're coming to your house and we're going to infect, infect you and all really? your family. Yeah. And so what Dr. Brown did was to set up the, uh, the laundry facility as an Ebola treatment unit. And so that became the first e Ebola treatment unit before Medicine Sans Frontier set up the larger Ebola treatment unit in Monrovia. So Europe was very helpful. How about the UN and the WHO? Well, the WHO is the in technical partner in health. It's, it is a technical partner for Liberia for a number of years. So when, when the Ebola epidemic hit Monrovia, well, they had WHO in Guinea and, and WHO in uh, Sierra Leone had already been dealing with it. So when Ebola hit Monrovia, WHO Liberia worked with the government, with the minute because they, they have to work with the Ministry of Health. They worked with the Ministry of Health to set up some kind of response mechanism. And then the CDC came in. Uh, and, and, and so with the WHO, the US CDC worked together to set up some kind of modality on how this response could be effective. But a lot of, tr it was a lot of trial and error in the beginning. Right, because, because no nobody did. really knew what to, what to do. And then the, the situation of handling dead bodies, you know, because when they, once they set up the treatment units, people began to flock there right. and there was not enough space. You didn't have the capacity to treat all these people. And so um, they were camping outside mm. the, 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 the tents, waiting for a bed kind of thing, you know. And, and so CDC provided a lot of technical support along with the WHO and other agencies, the European Union, uh, the Chinese came. Right, I read that was very interesting. <laughs> China came and helped also. They had a, a whole Ebola treatment unit. They, 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 they came with the first major supply of, of drugs and, uh, not drugs, of, of, of Ebola equipment and um, brought in their army, that, you know, to set up a tent to take care of these people. Right. Another interesting thing in the book is there was a lot of uh, misinformation, myths, and corruption that were in the way of this uh, along the way. I guess that happens all the time. But how did uh, you deal with that? Now, you, you became uh, Dr. Nienswa's main technical advisor. Tell us how that occurred. Well, I had worked with Talbert, uh, well, Back in 2008, 2009, I was on another assignment with, with, with um, Columbia University through U the UNDP, United, United Nations Development Program in Liberia. And he was then the deputy manager for the Ebola control, the, <laughs> The Ebola, I mean, not the Ebola, Ebola, the, the malaria control. Oh, okay. Uh, the malaria control uh, program. He was the, the deputy program manager. And they had actually, my role was to get them to do bed net distributions, help them raise funds and all that kind of thing. And that's how I met him. And we worked together. They had a global fund grant that they had lost because of certain technicalities. And so I instituted, uh, I initiated a fundraising action for them and raised money to pay their salaries for up to a year, that kind of thing. And so that's how we became friends. So when Ebola struck and he was appointed, he called me up and he said, you have to come and help me. And I'm like, to do what? I'm not an Ebola expert, <laughs> right. he said, but you're the only one I trust. 
mm. you know, because we had worked together so closely and yeah, he, we, we had a relationship. And he said, and, and I need you to come. You know, so people in my family were saying, you can't go to Liberia. Don't go to Liberia. You cannot go to Liberia. Right. That's and I'm like, scary. there is just no way I can refuse. Really? To go. And so I went to Liberia within a matter of five days. Really? You must yes. have been extremely frightened, no? No, I wasn't. Really? <laughs> I was, no. I would have been. I wasn't, I wasn't frightened. You know, I, I wasn't frightened because I said to myself, i got to protect myself. There are certain things I need to do to stay safe. And whatever is being recommended is what I will do. So literally, I arrive in Liberia and hit the ground running. He picked me up from the airport. The next morning, we were in meetings with all these different international groups. Wow. And I traveled everywhere with him, flew everywhere with him around the country, and did assessments of all of these things. You know, And so I was there for probably two months. And then I came back to the States. And uh, he said to me, you have to come back. And I'm like, are you going to pay me? <laughs> you want to get paid to be exposed, and he, and be exposed to Boa and get paid? And, and, he said, and he said, well, you know, we'll find somebody to bring you back. And so through the WHO, he arranged to bring me back. And uh, so I came in as his technical assistant coordinating the Ebola response in his, in his, in his office. Well, both of you did an awesome job, I'll tell you that. It was hard work. It's yeah. a lot of sleepless nights. I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, there were 4,800, over 4,800 people died, and it's a yes. relatively small country, population of about 5 million, so yes. that's a large percentage of people who died, and a lot more were sick and had all sorts of uh, medical problems uh, as a result as well. So you, the two of you did an incredible job. Well, it was a team of people. Right. It, it, it was a team of people because what they did, the, the response was broken up into uh, different categories. Every, every um, response pillar had a team lead who was a Liberian professional. And you, you had, so you, you had the team lead and the deputy team lead would be Liberians. And then you had members of the international community would be part of the team. Right. So you had all of these different teams of people handling different aspects of the response. So it was teamwork. I mean, we had to spend a lot of time strategizing on what needed to be done, uh, where treatment units needed to be set up and how to get funding and how to get the equipment and all this stuff to people. And, you know, it was, it was, it was a lot of work. We worked many oh, sure. long hours, you know, all day and, and many hours into the night. Plus, you were nervous that you might catch it also. I was so. never nervous. Really? No. You I was were never... I was courageous. I, I, well, I, I don't know if it was, it, it was something I felt an obligation to do. to do. I was born in Liberia. It was my home, you know, and uh, I wanted to do something significant that right. would change, the, turn the situation around. And so I, I was not afraid at all. I was fearless. Wow. I just did everything I needed to do. I mean, I took off my shoes at the door. I washed my sh the bottom of my shoes. I did everything I was supposed to do to keep myself safe. Well, it, it obviously worked. Yes. Uh, another interesting thing I read, more politics, is that as a result of this, there were lots of uh, medical articles written for the medical journals, uh, a lot of them written by Americans and Europeans, and initially they left out the Liberians who actually did lots of the research and, and did the work. And so the Liberian doctors and other people uh, didn't get any credit in these initial uh, papers. Yeah, well, you know, whenever, whenever these things happen, these responses happen, these uh, epidemics happen, you have people from the West and everywhere else, China, even the Chinese, China CDC was all there. Right. And you have all of these people coming and everybody wanted to gain their Ebola experience. 
Right. And you know, because it, it was new. A lot of people came to Liberia had never heard of, well, they heard of Ebola, but they didn't know much about it. Right. And everybody came wanting to get the Ebola experience. And so in order to get that experience, you've got to write papers. You've got to write and publish. And, but they were writing papers about the Ebola response in Liberia. And I was reading, and I'm like, where's your name? <laughs> you're the team lead for case management. How come you're not on this paper? You're the team lead for something else, communications. Why aren't you? And so I said to Talbert, what, what is the end objective here? What, what is it you want to gain from this experience besides getting the, uh, the recognition and besides having everybody know your name in Liberia? What would you like to achieve from this? Uh, because if you want to claim to be an Ebola expert, having worked in this high level capacity on the biggest response in history, you've got to publish papers. Right. You have to have your name on the papers. And so, you know, he talked to people at the CDC and other people, and they were saying, well, you know, these young kids come here, they've got to publish papers. And so everybody wanted first, second, and third authorship. And I told him, I said, no. As your advisor, you cannot have people writing papers about a response that you're in charge of as incident manager. Right. And your name isn't on any of them. None of your team members who are Liberians have their names on it. So we came up with this strategy that every paper that came out of Liberia had to be approved by him, the incident manager. And in many instances, we had to see a draft of that paper. Um, and, and he had to approve it. And that's how they started including Liberian team members right. uh, on, on some of the, it, it was intellectual properties. You know, intellect, and so we started this war about intellectual property. Who owns the intellectual property to right. what you're writing? You know, you're writing about my experience but I don't have anything to say about it. Right. Yeah. Reminds me of a paper I tried to publish uh, a year or two ago, and because I wasn't politically connected properly, it, it was uh, very difficult to, uh, to publish it. There's a lot of uh, politics involved in uh, getting uh, papers published in medical journals. Mm -hmm. so that's that's yeah. interesting that it happened even during the Ebola epidemic. Now, interestingly, a few years after you and Dr. Nianswan, the teams, and President Sirleaf eventually conquered this and got rid of Ebola, it took about 14 months uh, to do this. Yeah. Um, well, I, there were several epidemics. So the, the first epidemic was declared over in May, May 9th, uh, 2015, by WHO. And then within a few weeks after that, there was another epidemic, and this one was sexually transmitted mm. because the person, the, the transmission was from a woman whose husband was, a, was an Ebola survivor. And so there, you know, then they began to do research on Ebola survivors. They had a semen study, studying, right. yeah. So yeah. Apparently the virus can persist a long time in some body fluids. And they, in, in, in semen especially, in right. male, yeah. And so, so you had sexual transmission of Ebola, the second wave through this sexually transmitted uh, situation from this man to his wife. Right, and then a few years later, there was another outbreak, another epidemic in the Congo, where I think 13,000 people died. Yes. So uh, while the experience gained in Liberia was very helpful, it, epidemics still occasionally occurred. Well, in, in, in the Congo, you, you, you have to understand that they were also having civil uprising. Right. <laughs> you know, so the security issues, because the, the aid workers couldn't get to places, people couldn't get to hospitals. Uh, you know, because of security issues, a lot of people got infected because you couldn't cross these borders, you know, these arbitrary borders created by the different factions. Right. Another interesting thing, which I was surprised by, is that a few years after things quieted down, 
uh, Dr. Nienswa and his family were threatened by some uh, Liberians and eventually his family had to move to the USA because they feared for their lives. What, why did that happen? What was behind that? Well, actually, it happened during Ebola. During Ebola as well? Yeah, in 2015, hmm. he had to move his family out of Liberia because they were being threatened. They had to sleep in different locations. You know, they were like, a president, you know, some of those <laughs> presidents you hear about who can't sleep in one place, they have to, he had to sleep in different locations because people were threatening to go to his house and bring Ebola corpses or bring sick Ebola patients and just lay them on his lawn. And so his wife especially, they had three young children, and his wife especially was very disturbed she did not want her children, her family infected. She right. didn't want him infected. And she definitely didn't want herself or her children to be infected. So there was all this pressure on him. And so he found a way, friends in New York, uh, to accommodate them temporarily until they could get situated. And so he brought his family and went back to Liberia. Right, he went back. And he went back to Liberia. And he stayed in Liberia until 2019. And, uh, well, he stayed in Liberia until 20, 2019 when the new government that took over in 2018, President George Weah, when his government took over, uh, they, it, there were a lot of money going into Ebola. And Tauber did not manage the funding. You know, President Sirleaf had set up an Ebola fund that was managed by a fund manager and a comptroller that had nothing to do with those of us who were doing the actual response. So the new government thought that because out of the, what, the remaining monies that the U.S. government had spent through, through the Department of Defense, the government of Liberia requested that they, they build a public health Institute, you know, so the, the Liberia Public Health Institute was established as a result of e Ebola. Right. And so the funding was actually controlled by the U.S. Department of Defense. They hired the architects, they hired the con contractors, they hired the construction engineers, they hired everybody. But the government thought that Tobo Nyeswa had managed this Ebola money <laughs> and that he had this money hidden away somewhere. So they were demanding, <laughs> they were literally demanding that he should come up with the money. And he kept telling them, even the man who was the, the fund manager, Dorbo Jala, who was the fund manager, told them that this man had nothing to do with managing the funds. But they insisted, when, especially when they saw the, the Public Health Institute building going up. It's a fancy built structure, right. uh, which was funded by the U.S. Department of Defense. He didn't have, you know, they began to threaten him. And so he, he, he's a man who really gets around. So he had friends in all, all little, all places right. in, in Liberia. Right. And somebody told him, listen, these guys are coming for you. So he literally fled the country hmm. by leaving town, going home, packing his stuff, getting essential things, going to the airport, and getting the first flight out. And the first flight out was going to the Ivory Coast. <laughs> and that's how he got out and then called me uh, because he didn't even want to call his wife because they would be tracking him. And so that's when he called me and said, listen, this is a situation, and I'm in the Ivory Coast, and I'm going to find my way to the States. And that's how he got out of Liberia. So once he left, they issued a warrant for his arrest. Really? And, uh, you know, and it, it just got to be very complicated. This, this could be a nice uh, movie, I think. Yeah, they issued a warrant for his arrest. And uh, anyway, long and short of the story. Uh, he ended up having to get a lawyer, go to court, do all this kind of. He didn't go to Liberia, but he had lawyers representing him. Wow. And so, so this not is, only did he almost die from the virus, but also the repercussions of what happened after almost killed he, him as well. Yes, and he, he felt that if he had gone back, he would have been arrested and he may have been killed. Really? Yes. 
Interestingly, he mentions in the book a few times that his father, when he was a little kid, told, his father told him, you're one day going to lead Liberia and uh, become very important in Liberia's future. And, and that happened. Uh, had his father known what happened after that, he would be pretty upset, I think. Yeah, his father died before all this happened. Before this, yeah. Yes. But his father predicted that he would one yes. day lead Liberia. Yes. Um, so I think that was, that was uh, one of the principal reasons why he felt obligated to take on the assignment and do well by that him. That motivated him right. and inspired that was a, him to yes. do this. Yeah, that that's a, a great story. I think it would make a, a great movie. I understand there's there's now an Ebola vaccine. It's not available for everybody, but for people who are exposed or at high risk of exposure. Well, there 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 are two Ebola vaccines. Uh, there are several. Let, let me just clarify. There are two, uh, one out of China and one that is. The, Feder the Russian Federation that is used for emergency, uh, for emergency use. And then you have the European Union had approved the J&J &J vaccine. So that is what they were using, you know, uh, as their first vaccine when right. the, the Europeans, the British were all being vaccinated with the J&J &J vaccine. Do they work these vaccines? Well, there are several studies that have shown that there's a 70 to 100% uh, success rate with the, so, with the vaccine. The CDC website mentions that the Merck vaccine apparently is, is the best one, but it's, only, it's not used for the general population. It's used for high-risk exposure people. Yeah, because these things are still investigational. Right. So there are two investigational uh, drugs that are being used, and Merck is one of them. Hmm. Uh, that's interesting. Um, I know this this book, great book, by the way. Again, uh, was published with uh, Johns Hopkins University Press. Tell us how you got involved with them, and how Dr. Nienza got involved with uh, Johns Hopkins. Well, um, David Peters, who was the in the chair of the Department of International Health at Johns Hopkins during the Ebola response in Liberia, came to Liberia because Talbert had gotten his MPH in international health at, at Johns Hopkins. And so he invited Dr. Peters to come to Liberia. And so through that relationship, when Talbert finally, when, well, actually, Everybody was coming to Liberia to write a book about Ebola. Right. <laughs> okay. Right. And I remember this particular day, I was sitting in, in, uh, in, in, in Talbert's office in his uh, uh, waiting room with some, some of his staff. And this guy walks in. He, he used to work with, with UNICEF at the time. And he says to me, what are you doing here, Maria? You know, and I'm, I'm working, he says. I'm sure. I'm like, what do you mean you're sure? You know, he didn't realize that I was already there. I was already working. WHO had already brought me there, and I already, already was advisor to Mr. Nyenswa. So I was rightfully in that room, but he didn't know that I already knew that he had an appointment <laughs> to discuss writing a book mm. on the Ebola response. So I said to him, I said, this is a book that you should be writing. You said that to Tolbert. Yes. Yeah. I said, right. he was in no, charge. nobody should be writing this book. And because everybody's going to tell it from a European, American, or from a an epidemiological perspective. Right. But you want to tell the story. You want to narrate the story of what happened. Right. He was right there in the middle of it. You know, and, and how, you how you became prepared for this role. And you need to tell that story. I said, so if you give other people the permission to write the book, and if you start telling them what you want to put in the book, <laughs> then you won't have a book to write, and you right. won't have a book to sell. And so he listened to me. You know, 
what I have discovered in life is that sometimes people give you advice and you take it or you don't take it. Right. But Talbot really respected my role because I was very honest with him in, most in, in, in all instances, practically. And so he would listen to my advice. Right. And, and so, you know, he declined having this guy publish. Somebody else came and he declined. Right. Everybody and, wanted And it. so I said to him, you're connected to Johns Hopkins. Why don't we submit a proposal? So we went to Johns Hopkins' website. We got the thing and submitted a proposal. And we sent them the first what would have been our first five chapters, which didn't end up in the book. You know, a lot of it didn't end up in the book. But, um, and they found it interesting. And so the editor we worked with, Robin Coleman, mm -hmm. um, asked us to do a revision of the proposal. And some of the reviewers, because they sent it to so many reviewers, and some of the reviewers, we had written just one chapter about Talbert's life and his family, how he was prepared and this and that. And they say, we want to know more of this story. We want to know more about this man. And so that's why in the book you, you see his interspice between chapters, right. something about his life. Yeah, that was great. I really enjoyed yeah. that. And so, um, so once we did that, you know, Robin said, we'll publish the book. Wow, that's and great. so they gave a contract and uh, we did the first draft. And by that time, he was in the States. We were both in the States. And, uh, you know, we worked together to do it in different locations. <laughs> and so, sometimes we So would... who's going to play you and Tolbert in the, <laughs> in the, Netflix, in the Netflix movie Netflix. That, that's coming out about collapse yeah. and resiliency? I, I see it. That's funny. I, I'm serious. I think it's a, it's a great book. Incredible story. Uh, everybody should know about it. And, but thank uh, you. Yeah, and I think that uh, this would make a great movie. Uh, so you should contact the Netflix people. They're interested <laughs> in things like that. Well, you know, <laughs> when, when we set out to write this book, you know, my thing is whenever I start doing something, is like, what is the end use of this? Right. And what did we want to achieve with this book? We wanted to write it so that anybody could read it. So it's not highly technical. We, you know, we, we, did, we don't talk much about the epidemiology because every, everybody practically knows that. We talk a little bit about those technical aspects of Ebola, but we wanted to tell a story of how Ebola came to Liberia and what happened. The politics of it, the confusion in the government, the infighting in the government, the infighting amongst different ministries, corruption. the infighting, corruption, the, the, the great movie, everything that went into it. And so it's a narration of a story. You know, it, we, we try to make it a story that once you started reading it, it will be interesting enough that you won't want to put it down. Right. And so I hope we have achieved that. Yeah, I think people will be watching this. will will definitely get the book, and I see it as a New York Times bestseller. Really. So just for that would be a nice doctor podcast. So. <laughs> that would be nice. Well, thanks very much for well, coming today. Well, thank Dr. you, Star. I really appreciate thank you, it. thank this you. Was, I really, uh, I really enjoyed yeah, the, being here. This was fantastic. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you.